Welcome back to the Village Bonfire for another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. A podcast not just for your mind, but for your body and spirit too. Here we don't just talk theory. Instead, we compassionately engage with our lived experiences and a wide variety of topics together, all to invite the question, in these times we find ourselves in, how do we be more human? So welcome back to another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. And so as always, we begin with lighting a candle, invoking our village fire, feeling the warmth and heat of that flare up. As we start to gather around it, perhaps take a couple deep breaths in and out. And just let yourself arrive. Maybe imagine if there are threads of your awareness or energy or attention that are with people, places, or things that are not in your right here and right now, maybe you just invite those threads back in. And as we do... By doing that, it's almost like it's like we become whole in a way that right now I'm really feeling the image of like putting on a cloak and stepping into sort of some journey into another world or some journey into um, this sort of liminal space, right? Sometimes gathering around a fire, it brings us really here and now, but it does that so that we can kind of expand in other directions. And so by entering into ceremony space, by entering into this ritual space, we do that to sort of, yeah, open ourselves to feeling or seeing or experiencing something that might shift something for us or illuminate something or transmute something. Perhaps that something is even us. And so we honor this rich tradition of coming together in ways that are meant to transform the fires of transformation. We honor that that ritual in all its forms around the world, through time and space, in different lands, different lineages, We say thank you, thank you, thank you. And so today's episode is an audio only. So for those of you who are used to the video, we will have video again some other time, but today's an audio only. (laughs) And I have a guest with me, uh, Carrie Cajone. And so Carrie is um, one of the guests here around our fire who who came who came to this space sort of via this mysterious web of connection and social media, <laughs> which is really beautiful. And I was as I was looking through her various offerings and websites, I was really struck by both the depth and breadth of her studies and knowledge. And uh, we were emailing about our conversation at um, what might unfold today, sort of at a moment when I was contemplating how. Um, you know, we really are in sort of what feels like an epidemic of disconnection and unhappiness and, and that our culture really has normalized that and, and sort of roots into that. And one of Carrie's big things is that um, she supports people cultivating the joy of living. And so um, I'm sure that's a thread that will weave itself into our conversation today. And so I'm really excited to, to have her here. So welcome, Carrie. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So I'll read your bio. Carrie Hohone is a dream analyst, artist, and expert on the Eastern and Western archetypes that inspire our dreams and oracles. Through her website, Cafe O Soul, that's soul, (laughs) S-O-U-L, she bridges the gap between an appreciation for nature and the spiritual journey. 
Her online I Ching is ranked number one in internet searches. She is the author of seven books that include Dreams, Ancient Astrology, Tarot's Archetypes, and Translation of the Tao Te Ching and I Ching. She's also developed apps that achieved new and noteworthy status at iTunes, and her music incorporates shamanic drumming with world chants to enhance yoga and meditation practice. So yeah, that is quite an impressive list of um, creative endeavors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Whatever the muse is dishing up, I'm always, I always have my bowl out. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, if I mean, I know it, it can feel like such a, um, like channeling creative energy in that way, creativity in that way is like a, as a life force requires a certain capacity <laughs> for yeah. sure like yeah well it'll be interesting because we're going to talk about dreams today so every mm. every one of us are doing it every night while we sleep mm. channeling a ton of creativity mm. Mm. I just happen to have a good basket that I can bring it back with me <laughs> yeah beautiful well yeah well definitely I would love to get into that in a little bit so yeah but I like to start kind of before we go totally into it with just inviting you um, yeah, in cultures around the world, traditionally people introduce themselves more with, with, yeah, things that are kind of more social fabric, um, rather than just kind of the, what we do, right. Like the, who, where we come from and the, who, who we are in the world, like more in that social, social web. And so, yeah, is there anything, um, you would like people to know about you or you feel called to share today that kind of weaves you into that web for, for people listening? Well, I mean, I can't, I don't know if you mean like ancestral. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, recently, right before my birthday, actually, I kind of discovered I was, I was maybe related to St. Patrick. Oh. Because <laughs> there was like a whole line that I didn't know about. So that was kind of, kind of crazy. Um, so it makes you wonder what happened, what, whether I'll get like a drink at the pearly gates or something. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but um but you know I mean I have like a, a good heritage of I guess like you know the civil or not the civil war the American revolutionary you know the the rush the um Scottish Irish whatever so um mm -hmm. and I think that really kind of is probably why I am a little bit of a shaman you know like mm -hmm. I really feel that um when when we're dreaming you know we're definitely getting kind of that shaman shaman second sight and mm -hmm. um so and um I guess uh you know I mean I just I feel like I'm kind of a riverbank I guess in the flow mm -hmm. of things because I'm just uh accumulating all of the things that float by <laughs> building it into something that helps you know people that are not you know maybe stuck on a leaf and spinning around on a rock or mm -hmm. um you know kind of to help them get back in the flow and and I just sway from the, the bank of the river, and, mm. you know, I've created like a little place for people to, you know, I always envision my site, my website as like a place where people find their way to when they're, when they're really feeling alone or they don't have an answer or, mm. and, and it's just nice that they can self-help themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Creating those gathering places <laughs> mm -hmm. that people can find and touch into. So I guess the first question that kind of jumps out at me is, you know, you sort of, um, you know, I, I think the term shaman is such an interesting one in the sense that like, um, we sort of, you know, my understanding is the only people in the world who actually called themselves shamans were like, um, in Russia, actually more in the, that tradition. And then like anthropologists just sort of started applying it to indigenous wisdom keepers of different traditions around the world. But, you know, there's, there's still some sort of commonality that most of those share. And so I guess I'm curious when you sort of, yeah, use that term shaman, like, what does that mean for you? And, and what, um, what does that kind of, um, that second site that you were sort of mentioning, what, um, can you say a little more about that? Well, you know, I feel like we, you know, we all have access to kind of a, an objective way of viewing our lives. Um, that's why, like, whether it's through dreams, we sort of get outside of our ego and limitations or whatever. And we, we, are ha we have an opportunity to freely, like with no 
no holds barred, you know, like they're, we just freely look at all, all these um, options or, you know, possibilities for ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like people that don't remember their dreams, they can use oracles. And again, it's like some part of our, our deeper nature really wants to, to express itself because society is constantly pushing us towards conformity. So mm -hmm. when I say I'm a, when I say I'm a shaman, I just feel that, you know, what I would call second sight is an ability to connect with an individual and pick up those images, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like when, when we're all dreaming, we're connected in, in a way that we're not probably connected to even with the internet <laughs> and social media, you know, mm -hmm. by day, I feel like at night we kind of, we share kind of a, what maybe Carl Jung would call the collective unconscious or, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I think, I think shamans in a sense kind of retain that cord, you know, like mm -hmm. I can, you know, I can still access some of that here. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, and obviously a lot of my music is drumming, you know, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. kind of goes with it too, but, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, kind of a free, you know, looking to free the person who might you know, be struggling because they've like, they have self-limiting ideas that they need to shake off of themselves, you know, like mm -hmm. misunderstandings that they should have mm -hmm. never picked up along the way and stuck in their little pouch, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, I feel like we live in this world that, um, well, really poo-poos a lot of those, like accessing these other ways of knowing, you know, this sort of like living in the other world, like we sort of are, our, our, our over culture is very stuck in sort of this, like, um, much more kind of like linear, um, I don't know, tangible or sort of more material. It, yeah, it's a little more focused on the, on the, this worldly, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I would call it, I would call it marketable. Yeah, I mean, most, <laughs> most of the information that we that we're kind of forced to digest all day long mm -hmm. is, you know, is something that's been marketed to us as. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, Otherwise, no, I, I love that. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it also it tends to be more deductive, too. I feel like, you know, it's it's more like. Um, yeah, it, like in terms of how we arrive at things, it's like if this, then this, then this, you know, instead of kind of seeing things as this like ever spinning emergent web, you know, of uh -huh. connection and connectivity and possibility. And, um, you know, but I think it's so interesting. You actually use the word objective, like that, that when we dream, we tap into sort of, we can tap or when use the tarot or, you know, the I Ching, you know, whatever these, these other access points, you know, we can tap into this sort of, and I think you actually use the word. Yeah. Like I said, objective, um, ways of knowing. And I think it's so interesting because our overculture would probably call those very subjective and not objective. And so I guess, yeah, do you have, mm -hmm. would you like to, yeah, elaborate more on that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, um, if, if we're, if like from what I've, you know, put together in terms of dreamers research and, and my dream research, and this has been decades and decades I've been doing this is what kind of led me to all these ancient texts and art type studies. And, um, and I, and and one thing I would say too is like our world today is not worse than it was like maybe two thousand years ago, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just a different. It's a different condition, but we still have you know the we have uh, we have our stories that we tell each other to to help you know cheer us up as we're facing some of the, you know the survival things that we have to go through when we're struggling to find mm -hmm. something to eat or you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So we've all, we've always been that way. Um, but I feel like, you know, as if, if I know one of the things that you mentioned before we got on, on the call or when we were talking about email, you know, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. And I, and I really like, I, I think of all, um, everything on the, this planet or whatever, I mean, we're, there's a lot of organisms and we're just one of the organisms mm -hmm. and each organism has, has like, it's been given certain qualities to process what I think of as like the entropy in the universe, we organize it and we make sense of it. And we, you know, and, and each little 
organism thinks they're doing the most important job and they are, mm -hmm. you know, even mm -hmm. like even the plankton and the, you know, bottom of the ocean or, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, we're, we're no better, but mm -hmm. we, we were given, you know, this, this set of um, this intelligence, you know, this uh, sometimes I refer to it as, you know, kind of tapping our 24 hour mind because all day long we have one way of looking at the world and then we go to sleep and we have another way of looking at the world, but it's mm -hmm. one mind having the experience. Mm -hmm. So some, somehow as an organism and being human, you know, we were given this ability to sort of um, keep pushing beyond the known, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if it's imagination or whatever. And I, and I don't know, you know, like I always look at my dog thinking, well, her thing is to try to come up with the best face to get the little face she can make at me that will get whatever she wants or, you know, everybody, everybody has their own agenda, but, uh -huh. you know, I feel like we were designed by nature to, um, like we have what I, I guess ego is really just the crust of our defense mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything that we've done up to this point to survive and get the things that we need to make us feel safe, it becomes ego. And then, and yet the body's designed to just like, it has a paralytic feature, parts of consciousness abate, like we're not unconscious when we sleep, but parts of the brain that we use for logic and all that aren't active. And, and so we just kind of encounter a different possibility. And we don't, we even think we're awake when we're dreaming, you know, it's mm -hmm. that real. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you just look at our existence, almost half of our existence is in that condition. And it's a very creative, very growth oriented, evolutionary, you know, perspective. And I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but, yeah. you know, in terms of like, what, what really makes me laugh about this world is like, the more that we know, the more we realize we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, any, anyone's got to admit that, like, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's in, you know, physics or neurology or, you know, just trying to describe the brain and consciousness, it's impossible. So for anybody to, um, you know, say that this is the right way to live your life, or this is, mm -hmm. you know, the wrong way. To me, it's all about what makes you happy. You know, how if you're, if you're living your life in a way that you feel more, you know, in touch with the food that you're eating or sharing with your family or whatever it is, that's important, you know, so Hmm. So I think, um, you know, so when I say that there's a side of us that wants to be understood, um, that that side, like I always say, the dreams know the dreamers more than they know themselves. I think it was uh, when a young student that said that. Um, but there's some side of us that seems to know where we're going. And it sort of starts to come out when we start following our dreams and interpreting them. And so there's a part of us that that wants to have, you know, have, have an expression that may be all those things that, that you were talking about, the way that life tells us this is right and this is correct and this is logical and this is where you need to be. Mm -hmm. All those things, they just take us away from our unique, ex, you know, whatever we were here to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I had so many threads kind of spinning there as you were speaking. <laughs> and so let me just take a moment here to kind of, yeah, feel into, um, yeah, well, I guess, um, as I'm sort of, yeah, waiting to see if any of those kind of pop, but I, you know, you said you've been doing sort of I guess, how did you get into dream analysis and, and, you know, how did, how did that part of your journey sort of start to unfold? Um, I kind of was born that way. <laughs> mm. I mean, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I, I was just, I was interpreting people's dreams when I was little mm. and I just kind of understood the met metaphoric expression. Um, in fact, you know, like I always compare it to poetry appreciation not everybody mm -hmm. likes poetry or can appreciate it, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's that same sort of like symbolic representation of an emotional condition, you know, that's put forward in poetry, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so, and then, you know, I mean, I just, as a kid, I knew that they were relevant and important. And then I just kind of, you know, 
dedicated my life to kind of studying it and psychology. And when I was in school, you know, they back in whenever back back long ago, <laughs> but they, you know, you had to choose between Freud or Jung. Where I see mm-hmm. they're both important, you know, mm-hmm. they both, you know, um, so there, so and there was a lot of people that were studying psychology that seemed to like want, you know, maybe they had something going on with themselves. <laughs> they were studying mm-hmm. psychology. I don't know, but Mm-hmm. But yeah, so and then, you know, and then a lot of it was just um, I, I talked to people daily all over the world in all different cultures and see similar patterns or mm-hmm. and then I've been doing this for like four or five decades. Mm-hmm. So you start to see um, that it's kind of like, like I, sometimes I think of myself as Sacagawea. Mm-hmm. You know, remember her? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like, she was the she was mm-hmm. translating Lewis and yeah. Clark. I think it was guiding Lewis and Clark. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so, I just feel like everybody's floating by in a boat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some people want to know what is that? What is that sound I'm hearing? Well, let's listen. Oh, well, this is what it is, or you know. So, I'm just sort of an interpreter of their own, you know, and sometimes, I mean, I've had a really strong sense of like, oh my God, I'm so glad she found you because I've been wanting to do this for so long or, you know, like, Mm -hmm. especially like nightmares and stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, because people are like, I say that they're a good thing that they're having an awakening, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that they're having like a power. I I look at it like natural disasters, you know, Mm -hmm. at things that look bad are actually good because it's Mm -hmm. bringing back growth hmm so yeah yeah I'm a thread that I feel like yeah it came up earlier and then feels like it's coming up again it's sort of you know you mentioned yeah so much of it is like what are the stories that we're telling ourselves you know whether it's in our waking lives what are the stories that we're telling ourselves about what's possible or about um reality you know and Mm -hmm. and and it's perceived limitations or or you know sometimes real limitations like while we are in these human forms there are certain limitations (laughs) um that's why it's good to have other people to tell stories to share stories with because mm, then then we don't get caught up in our own you know yeah yeah well and so I feel like I've been having these conversations recently with some people more from kind of the the Celtic Isles, um, you know, Ireland and Scotland and stuff having, you know, and talking about sort of the mythical ancestors and how the stories are in the land. And I know some of the First Nations people here in the United States or Turtle Island, if we call it that, um, are, you know, have have sort of similar traditions, you know, and I'm I'm aware that, yeah, like that this conversation that we're having, so much of what we're talking about is sort of happening like in sort of that more upper world and also like kind of in the, you know, that there is no time and space <laughs> like mm-hmm. at this, at this sort of the, of what we're, what we're speaking about, like at the level of consciousness and, and energy and, and symbol and archetype. Um, and yeah, so I guess what's your sense, you know, well, or I guess I feel like maybe that's some of what you're kind of getting at when you sort of said this, this almost like, I mean, kind of what is objective and subjective, right? But like mm-hmm. this sort of this other way of knowing, right? And that it opens up the possibilities of the stories that we tell ourselves, which and then can, oh yeah, what were you going to say? Uh, if if they, if, the, you know, I feel like when we're dreaming, it's a lot like digestion. If it's, if it's mm. nutritious, it stays with us. If it's not, it's eliminated. And, mm. you know, and, and if our, if the stories we're telling ourselves, you know, are good and keep us, you know, happy and growing and they're good stories, but it's the stories that are, you know, self-defeating or, uh, which, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you want to talk about cultivating the joy of living. Sure. Yeah. This feels like a segue. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> I, feel, I feel, you know, I feel like what I, where I've come to right now in, in my life is like, I live in a mountain with a river running by, you know, with trees. And I feel like I live in, in the physical landscape of my philosophy. Like mm-hmm. I, I live in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada. And it's total wild. It's not like it, I lived in Tahoe for a long time, but I found a really wild place. But anyway, um, so I feel like um, at this point, like, you know, I do I do a lot of Taoist coaching. And, mm-hmm. I, t- you know, you had mentioned I did some translations. 
for whatever reason, and I'm surprised I'm not Chinese because I really have a deep connection to ancient Chinese thought. But, um, you know, what makes that philosophy different from what we had in the West is that they really looked at nature to understand the human condition. And that's really where you get the Tao Te Ching and the I Ching as, you know, think water, how water, you know, I think Eckhart Tolle and a lot of people nowadays are sort of given us a revamp of, of Taoism, but the, you know, power of water when it meets an obstacle. And, but I feel like, you know, if I was to boil it all down to like, where do you get the joy of living? One of the most important things is not, not falling prey to thinking that we're the host, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and also I always say, you know, kind of hover at the doorway of perception, you know, become the master of your response. And I know that might sound like, oh, blah, 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 blah. But, but the point (laughs) is that, you know, be in wonder because we don't know Mm -hmm. anything. And, and every, every moment is an opportunity. Like I, you know, sometimes I see like, but a big flying swarm of, you know, today's insects, you know, mm-hmm. that are, you know, nature's best expression of what it is. And um, nature's expressing the best of what it is at any moment. And we're part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would say too, part of what's been interesting for me and my sort of reconnecting with some of my like family lineage, ancestral roots is that, you know, um, is, is rediscovering sort of the animistic, you know, I mean, even Europe had plenty, even the quote unquote West had plenty of animistic traditions. If you kind of look back, Mm -hmm. right, look back far enough. Yeah. And really look at like, and they do. Yeah. What does nature, what does nature have to teach us? And you know, I love what you're pointing to here about um, like something else I've been kind of exploring um, personally is, is and, and noticing is sort of this lack of elders that we sort of seem to have that role of elder in our culture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and what what is that difference between just becoming older versus becoming an elder? And, you know, I think some of that is actually like whether life like whether I think some of it's whether we let life, um, I'm always reminded of that Velveteen Rabbit quote about like, um, you know, all the fur gets rubbed off and all the, um, you know, um, there's patch, you know, it gets patchy and I'm like butchering the quote. It's really beautiful, but anyway, (laughs) but it's like the idea that, you know, at, at the end of life, like you should, you've kind of let life like rub you raw and uh-huh. through doing that, you, you might seem ugly, but, but you're, there's actually a beauty that comes out and a wisdom that comes out. And, mm-hmm. and so that difference of like, whether we let the friction that is kind of like living in this world, right. Cause I feel like it can feel like friction, you know? Um, and so whether we let that like build up calluses on our skin or whether we let it disrobe um, us. Right. Back to wonder actually. <laughs> right. And I mean, right. that's the beauty I think is like so many true elders, you know, there's actually this childlike light that sort of shines out of them. Um, and, and I think so much of it is that state of, of wonder rather than answers. Right. So it just seems like, you know, that's, to me, that's like the, the most simple thing is being kind of the guest and 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 looking to see how life can surprise you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I see that a lot too when I work with clients. You know, so often we have these like younger versions of ourselves that sort of got had something happen to them that was overwhelming at the time, and they didn't have the support they needed in that moment to like learn how to work through that. And so it's kind of like a part of us gets frozen in time. You know, at that age. And so as I work with clients and, and if that comes up in a session, you know, one of those younger aged versions of them, you know, I always have the image of like this, like little kid who's got their hands on the driver's wheel, you know, uh-huh. and they're, and like, when I, when we kind of work with that process and invite them to kind of let invite the child to remove the hands from the wheel and like, come back to more of like an age appropriate you know, state of being so that the adult version of them can like be at the wheel, you know, Uh there's always such a relief, you know, because like that child didn't want that child felt incredibly overwhelmed being in charge, you know, or thinking Mm -hmm. it needed to be in charge. And, 
And so I feel like there's something too in what you're saying here about like, yeah, this, our humanity, right? That actually it's a little bit of a relief, like as scary as it sometimes is to like admit we don't have control or that we don't know anything. Like there's maybe an initial fear to kind of get over with that. But then it's like, if we can do that, I don't know. Yeah, it feels like a relief because it's like, oh, right. I don't have to be in charge because this world is like so much bigger (laughs) than anything (laughs) I should like be in charge of. (laughs) Yeah. And and I mean, really, if you like look at it statistically or whatever, but it seems like life beats us up when we get too much in control. Mm -hmm. Like really the times that get most challenging is when our idea of where we need to go is different than what the path might be that would, you know, tap our greater capabilities. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't think even, yeah, I think if a child is in control and then you become an adult, it, even though you, the child gives up control, I don't, I don't think that the adult needs to then take control. Needs to take control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and I've always felt like this, like you can get up and, and there's like a carriage that pulls up day after day, after day, after day. And everything that you encounter has some relevance and, you know, mm. And it's like um, that when we, you know, I don't know, it just seems like everything can get really uh, negative when we're like, oh, no, it has to be this way or it has to be that way. Or so Mm -hmm. I feel. And so the saying is like, don't be the host, be the guest or, Mm -hmm. you know, and and when I think of the host, wow, that's like some. And it's like blows my mind every time I see little variations of it, you know, Mm. but you can only show up and see it when you're not being the host, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're the guest. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. so you talk about different ways of knowing. I really believe that our biggest gift that nature endowed us with is that um, imagination. Mm. That's what's active when we're dreaming That's what, you know, allows us to create if we want, you know, but it's what can, you know, on even a day when we wake up and things aren't going our way or whatever, if we can just let the, you know, carriage pull up, look out at the world and wonder, chances are we're going to find something that speaks to us. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we connect with it and it feels like our life has more meaning. Mm. So that's really about, you know, not having the agenda. Yeah. 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 I think one of the, the, I don't know if trap is the right word, but one of the stumbling blocks maybe, or yeah, that I, that I see, or, um, people sort of sometimes fall into as they start to transition into more of like learning that symbolic language, um, and coming into that place of like interpreting, um, you know, interpreting the things that are happening to us um, or for us <laughs> throughout our days, like in kind of more of that symbolic um, other way of knowing kind of realm mm-hmm. um, is it seems like at, at first, it seems like there's a stage many people go through where they don't they're learning the language and they don't yet have it. And I think some of that's like culturally, at least here in the U S we don't um, have a lot of uh, collective, you know, space for that, but uh, which is probably why gatherings places like your website are, are really helpful for people. Um, But it's like, then it feels like sometimes people that there's a stage that people go through where then it's like interpreting everything and kind of getting stuck in analysis paralysis or mm-hmm. like um not knowing how to interpret what's happening and so you go to the website you know you put in a google search and there's like you know there's a lot of commonalities maybe but there's also a lot of differences and then you know people tend to like sometimes it feels like there's an initial stage where it can almost take you further away from your inner knowing um because it maybe feels like so much information and so new. So I guess, do you have, um, like, do you see that happen for people? Do you have tips? Do you, yeah. Like what, um, what do you see as kind of the way to sort of start learning that language of people if are newer to that? Um, well, I honestly, I don't think, I don't think overthinking anything is helpful. And I, I see a lot of people <laughs> that I work with 
that are, you know, on a spiritual path. And we're not what I would consider like learning how to be in flow, mm. you know, um, they're seeing as like, so they start putting parameters and discipline mm-hmm. and it's not right. And it's like, well, what, what, what? You're, you're missing the whole point, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think, you know, that, that sense of wonder that I am, that I'm all about cultivating it, you know, the sense of not knowing is completely at odds with wanting to know, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, like, let's say, for example, someone wakes up and they have a dream and they want to go online and, you know, search for the meaning or, and all that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of food for thought, but, mm-hmm. you know, maybe five sites will give them a slightly different answer. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, but they're, com- but it's still not, um, it's kind of like just a piece of the whole puzzle. It's not like, you know, like for example, if the dream was saying, you know, you're you're not on the right path, or mm-hmm. um, and and dreams can be that, you know, revelatory or whatever. But mm-hmm. so then you you don't go looking for okay, well, what's the, where's the path? Where's my path? Where's my path? Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like you stop and you kind of look around and you have you have to look and see where you are before you can look and see where you're going. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. So I'm just not a big one on like I I. I put the oracles on my website for people because they can't remember their dreams. I would say 90% of the people Mm -hmm. that will go to sleep tonight won't remember their dreams tomorrow. We weren't Mm -hmm. designed to remember because we're using two different parts of the brain, you Mm -hmm. know, and, but yet they're, they're profoundly changing us. And what I see is when people, you know, really make an effort to kind of like get in touch with the information, it can be, you know, it can really be insightful and it can sort of um, speed up maybe decades of, you know, drudgery of carrying around some wound that didn't need to be there, you know, so -hmm. dreams can be, can be helpful that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I mostly don't remember my dreams, but I have, there are several key transition, um, transformation moments in my life that I can point to a dream as the beginning of it. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. And like, maybe not the beginning, because obviously, like, again, at this level, like time and space aren't actually linear, right? And so the the unfolding of realizing that, oh, I'm on the wrong path, or, oh, mm-hmm. there's, um, you know, something, there's a, there's a, yeah. My, a, I, I call it my makeup dream. I was a clothing buyer on Rodeo Drive and Trump Towers. Like I had the job that anybody in their 20s would have died to have. Mm -hmm. And I kept having a dream that I was on the plane and I didn't have my makeup. And -hmm. it was like, whoa, I couldn't, in the dream, it seemed like I couldn't go because I didn't Mm -hmm. have my makeup. It wasn't like I could go, I'm going to be in Paris. Maybe I could pick up some (laughs) French makeup. And it was really clear to me that was, you know, I People thought I was nuts when I left that job, but it was mm. not me. I'm so much, you know. So yeah, so I caught, so I, I think we all can have that kind of dream that shows us we're not really on the right path. Yeah, yeah, and I had one that I think was even sort of a soul reclamation. You know, now that I've sort of have done more studies into more, you know, sort of quote unquote shamanic um, work, you know, is actually like a soul retrieval. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, like two aspects of my psyche ended up like meeting for the first time and having a reconciliation. Um, And that was really, that was sort of a really powerful moment on my like personal healing or or reparative or wholeness journey. Um, And yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Even last night, I actually had a sort of a dream that I, again, I don't totally remember it, but there was definitely a moment where my teeth started crumbling and falling out, which I know can be a really powerful. Yeah, it is. um, It's common. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was feeling into that more and, you know, and I do, I think I love what you're saying there about, it's like, it's an invitation to pause. You know, Mm -hmm. I think we, so we're so trained to want to go right for like, what does it mean? And like somehow make it into like a statue rather than a tapestry, a weaving right. tapestry or, you know, whatever, okay. you know, it's like, we want to label it and like put it in a box and like figure mm-hmm. it out and then move on, you know? And it's mm-hmm. like the thing comes. And for me anyway, I've been sitting with that this morning of like, okay, what is like, so teeth what coming. are teeth and what is it mean <laughs> in my body? And okay. <laughs> teeth are some of the most rigid structures in the body. And yes, there's definitely an invitation in my life in some areas to like, let some rigidity crumble and, 
you know, and but it's, all, it, it it's also can be about credibility. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, like it could be that something you're saying isn't true or, you know what I mean? Like it can be mm-hmm. a call to look at what you're trying to defend as important. Maybe it's not important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, a lot of times I see teeth uh, uh, relating to kind of credibility and mm-hmm. all, also like our teeth fall out at important periods, like wisdom teeth, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, yeah. There's definitely a rebirth happening for me right now. There's a, there's a big cycle that's been closing in my life and yeah, some new one opening. So, um, yeah. But anyway, I just offer that example for people listening. Yeah. <laughs> to kind mm-hmm. of, yeah. You're into the process. So it's like, for me, I know I like, I feel into my body a little bit to notice like, it, yeah. Is there fear that's coming up or does it feel good? Or, you know, cause that can kind of give me some context maybe for the message. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I'll ask later on in the day, like, or a couple days later or weeks or whatever, like, is there is there any other, was there anything else happening? You know, so I had this one key image of the teeth crumbling, but then as I felt into it later this morning out on my walk, I was like, oh, there's actually this, like, like there was a death thing happening that alongside of it. So when I zoomed out from just that one image and I asked if there was like another image connected with it, you know, and Mm -hmm. what came up was this like death image. And so it's like, okay, the teeth are probably somewhat about like rebirth, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, but I definitely think you're right too, that there's definitely something around image too has been coming up a lot recently. So, and, and I think that's a good, um, example of not having a rush to judgment. I mean, obviously we're Mm -hmm. dreaming about what we don't know. Mm -hmm. We're Mm -hmm. dreaming about what we repress all day or, you know, shove down or so when we have the dream, even like, we don't want to rush to judgment on what it means. We want to kind of sit with it because we, there's a part of us that doesn't that needed to have the information because it didn't know you know what I mean mm-hmm. yeah there's that um um oh gosh it's not roomy it's um a Rilke Rilke quote yeah. um that that's like the live, live in the question live in the, live the question I love yeah. that My yeah favorite. Yeah. Live the question now so that someday you'll live your way into the answer in some distant future, you'll live your way into the answer. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what we need for these other ways of knowing and they do, they move more slowly. And I think to kind of bring that thread back to like that nature piece, you know, I think that's part of what nature and, you know, for me, my work has a lot to do with like embodiment too, because our bodies are nature, you know, they're, as you said, just an organism out of many, like uh-huh. in this web of life, you know, on this planet. And, and that to me is so cool when mm. we can just like lay there in like the the slop of all the different organisms <laughs> and not feel <laughs> not feel better, you know, more important, just like living live in our sloppiness, you know, I think that's mm. really cool. Yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to be said just for that organizing mechanism, right? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like in terms of like why we can get so wrapped up in making everything complicated. It's our nature. Mm. Mm. Our nature yeah. to make everything complicated? Well, organisms organize. Yeah. That's what they're they doing. Do. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, we were making everything complicated because it's our, you know, we're figuring out like I like I was saying before it's like we were given a different kind of brain or Mm -hmm. you know who knows if our brain is doesn't wasn't designed just for sexual reproduction you know we don't know but Mm -hmm. you know but it's a little different from what we see around us you know and so we're we're organizing the ideas and information and Mm -hmm. we're like you know squirrels are organizing nuts and Mm -hmm. you know like Mm -hmm. (laughs) um mycorrhizal so, fungi are organizing root <laughs> systems and right, exactly. between plants yeah exactly and yeah. so you know we can we cannot uh, and and that part of living in in illusion of course we can live in illusion because we have the capacity to make things in illusion mm. do you know what i mean like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the you know that's why i'm very comfortable saying nobody really knows you know yeah so why not like, you know, just open to discovery and possibility and yeah, I know it sounds trite, but I just, I live there in that, 
that almost becoming spot. <laughs> Just watching without yeah. rushing in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it seems to be more joyful in that spot when you can kind of so. like unlearn the other stuff that sort of tells us to be afraid of that spot when we can like unlearn that and arrive in that spot. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, and I think for me, yeah. So, I mean, what you're talking about too, like that's like, it almost takes that sort of slower pacing sometimes you know, and, and I'm aware, I think you have a background in technology too. Is that right? In the tech world, um, which feels like that's such a fast pace way of like organizing. Right. And so I guess like, I'm curious, you know, that's yeah. Feeling into that space of like when and where it's like, we have to like, let ourselves just be with the slow paced like sort of outside of our control organizing. And then when like, cause sometimes we can have like those, you know, people call them quantum leaps or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. like, you know, you have that flash of insight and then things just like all seem to fall into place, you know, and it mm -hmm. feels fast or, you know, technology can be so fast. And so I guess, um, yeah, I'm curious, like what, what is that like for you, I guess, being in those worlds of, of, um, like hmm. the allowing, I guess I see technology um, in a much more simple way. Like one of my favorite things is um, Leibniz, like came up with the whole binary code off of the yin and yang lines, open and closed. Like hmm. he basically laid a hexagram on its side and, you know, kind of we, that's how simple all of our technology can be boiled down to an open and closed line. Hmm. You know what I mean? So I kind of mm -hmm. see it. I see it. I don't really see it as something complicated. I mean, uh, tech technology for me just sort of like allowed me to connect with a uh, with um, a younger generation who would be who was also interested in the things that I write about, and uh, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, I think you know, like for example, AI. Like I, I've used it a little bit, and mm -hmm. you know, and I just I don't know. I, I guess I don't give it as much credibility as maybe other people in terms of oh yeah it's going to take all our jobs <laughs> they took our jobs what was that there's some show where that they kept I think it was South Park <laughs> they took our jobs <laughs> you know, somebody's always taking a job uh -huh. but yeah but um <laughs> um I just feel like you know I don't know I just I don't see any I mean I definitely think slowing down to uh, to be in the moment and to observe and not rush to judgment, you know, all that's good. I guess, you know, like when you think of like the connectivity, the, how quickly we can get information, mm -hmm. you know, when we have a question, whether it's right or not, or accurate or, mm -hmm. um, the, but the way that it, it sort of connects us all together. I mean, I think for me, I think it's really cool that, you know, I can go, one hour I'm talking to somebody in Malaysia, the next hour I'm talking to somebody in Ireland or mm -hmm. somebody in Hong Kong or like, I love that I can reach people all over the world, you know, and that I can Zoom call with them. And, and you know, I love yeah. that most that we can, we can find other people that share our ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels like technology is sort of this collapsing of like the idea of linear time and space, which, you know, is, is totally in keeping with these other ways of, of sort of knowing that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is, may, it may be that time that, I, you know, whatever time, how it weaves itself in our three dimensions to become the fourth dimension. It could just be some, it could just be an illusion. You know what I mean? Like we, mm -hmm. we think that there's an arrow of time or, um, I mean, I feel like when we're dreaming, it might be that we're accessing something that really doesn't have the same time sense. Mm -hmm. If we, sp if we were spending most of our time over in our dream state, we're kind of in, we're almost dead, right? Like there's mm -hmm. something else. There's something other than the way we understand time here. I, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. I just went off on a tangent, but I just think our idea of time and the perpetual unfolding moment, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I feel like time isn't so real. I mean, really, in your dream state, you can have some sense of time, but it, it's not linear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so it feels like sort of our technological advances are like getting us closer and closer to that in many ways. Cause you know, in our lives, because we're we're not embodied, like we're like in in our dream I state, we're so. not really embodied. But in in technology, yeah. we're not embodied. So there's that similarity, right? But yeah, but then it's like, I guess the thing that sort of it feels too though, like we're losing some element of that perhaps is a value that's in this three D form and like in our waking day reality and like our waking brain <laughs> reality of like we're losing yeah. it because of technology I, is that what you're saying well not necessarily I mean I think it happened before technology but technology seems like it's helping that along and I don't know this is kind of like I'm yeah I don't know that I <laughs> have have a fully formulated like thought mm -hmm. here yet um maybe it's yeah. taken us out of nature yeah, yeah, I think that some of it is, I think, and I think that's more when it began. It's like, there's been this coinciding in, in some cultures in particular, and particularly, I think a lot of the European ones that as we've, you know, and by technology at this point, I mean, like even industrial revolution, you know, so like whatever the quote unquote progress is, um, it feels like that's been happening at the expense of our sense of belonging in nature. Mm -hmm. And so then as we kind of have extrapolated that out over the centuries, you know, now we're like finding ourselves in this space where yes, like our technology is actually mirroring in many ways, like our perhaps like more of these dream states, more of these kind of less embodied, you know, yeah, you can talk to somebody in Malaysia, like instantly, instead of having to like send a letter or a mm -hmm. runner with beans or a, you know, like, or walk there yourself and boat, you know, whatever, however you, and really you know. like, what's the future of that? When you, when, when we realize that we all feel the same way, you know, we all kind of have the same challenges or I think mm -hmm. that like where that I look at the good things of technology, mm -hmm. like the way that it sort of, you know, when I wrote a lot of my first books, I was like, and and even my music, I cross, I bring this culture with that culture and I do sort of a, you know, blend, blend of like reggae with, you know, Chinese or, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, early in my work, I was all about breaking down the boundaries, you know, and especially like in the spiritual uh, religious ideas that were separating us. A lot of the things that I wrote were, was to look like, hey, this is the same story. It's here, it's here, you know, or, or a, mm -hmm. there's like, mm -hmm. we have, we have this common thread. But I think that over the last 10 or 15, 20 years, we're watching that all sort of crumble. I mean, yeah, we got this horrible war going on or, you know, wherever that, you know, hopefully that will work itself out. But 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 a lot of this, the wars that were about, you know, people upholding their religion as being the only one that's allowed to be or something, you know, we went, we, mm -hmm. we had a lot of wars and I feel like technology mm -hmm has allowed people to, to see that we're, we're all the same, mm. you know, we think the same thing. And now we, we can argue over, what do you call it? Do you call it Tao? Do you call it God? Do you call it Jesus? Mm -hmm. Do you call it, you know, the Buddha, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we, you know, we're, we're kind of all in this together. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't. So, and even like with the AI, like I, I use it a little bit kind of to, I don't know. And I just see that it's, it's, there's a lot of limitations and it's just sort of like a glorified search engine. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about the chat, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, like it pre, it can give you a lot of information, but so did Google two years ago when you did a mm -hmm. search in the box, you know, so there's, there, we have a ways to go. I think before technology would be threatening, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's given us a lot of good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious about sort of navigating for me personally, anyway, I find myself curious about sort of navigating this world where we take the good of it and also like, make sure that we're still, that we're not throwing ourselves headlong into sort of this world at the expense of like our bodies and nature and, um, you know, just because I think we sort of have this cultural programming that 
technology is separate from nature um, or that one happens at the expense of the other. Um, I just, you know, I, I, for me, I just think like we showed up seconds ago. We're so mm-hmm. not important. Mm-hmm. We're, you know, we're like, we're like that swarm of flies that showed up, you know, in the sunlight of today's, you know, ex- expression of nature. Like, I don't, I feel like we, before we would ever do harm to the world, we would perish, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, so I don't, you know, again, like I'm not, in, that to me is part of not being the host, be the guest or mm-hmm. like, and, and I don't worry because I know that everything works out. It, like life seems to be on a trajectory of just getting better I mean that's one thing we can we can agree on that that's a truth that seems pretty obvious is that whatever nature's been doing for billions of years what it's doing today is about the best version of it so far Mm -hmm. so we're part of that you know and I think we you know again I a lot of it is that media machine marketing information to us to scare us And the more frightened we get, the more we keep buying into it, you know, and I really think that we can, uh, you know, there's so much beauty and so much goodness. And and I think that that that's real, too. Does that sound like Pollyanna? (laughs) What do you think? I mean, I I think that the world is how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, is there, you know, did we pollute a lot of stuff? Yeah, I grew up, I grew up when fish were dying on the beach in Lake Erie, <laughs> like, mm. I, there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think, I, I mean, I think it both is and isn't, right? I mean, in kind of the way a lot of this conversation has sort of been beyond this either or, <laughs> right? like, framework, right, is like, there's a lot that feels scary and I think probably rightly so, or I feel like there's a lot that's inviting us into like a, um, a, a reckoning with some of our behaviors. I mean, like you said, with nightmares, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, so if we're looking at sort the of natural of disasters, the natural like, disasters, right? Exactly. There's, but like they have a good purpose, you know, and, and even like, extinction. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like it, it will all work itself out because mm-hmm. if we start to, you know, do anything, you know, I don't know. I just, I don't, I guess I don't dwell on mm-hmm. all the, you know, all the ways that the world could, you know, and, and even fear is really to me, like is, is a ballast for creativity. Mm. Anything that's negative is like, it offers an opportunity for something new Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well and there's some of that wider perspective that I feel like we kind of started talking Mm -hmm. about you know Mm -hmm. that way and really like I think that was how we began the discussion too that you know the world the world 2000 or even 10,000 like I you know, I mean, there's, we, we, we knew some stuff way back then too. I mean, that's like, that'll be our next big discovery that it didn't start in 2,500 BC. We're going to find <laughs> out we had, we've had some hidden information, but you know, I mean, the, the, it was not much different than what we have now. Like, you know, just, a, just a different sort of scenario. We're not, you know, we're not on boats going from port to port. <laughs> right. You know, right but we're finding different other ways of like sharing cross pollinating. I call it, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. we're all coming together and sharing little bits of this. So then it grows into that. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Microorganisms organizing. <laughs> right. I love that one. Real. I love like the messiness of life. I really like, like it keeps us humble, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, and don't, you know, and again, back to the joy of living, mm-hmm. don't, you know, just don't take it so serious. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like I believe that it, it's so uh, wondrous that, you know, all we have mm-hmm. to do is open to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like and, for me, yeah. What were you going to well, because we were talking about how today is not very different from long ago. Did you ever read the Epic of Gilgamesh? 
I love that. It's kind of like the Gil- Gilligan's Island of like 2500 BC. Oh. <laughs> like it's a it, it's of stone tablets that they found in ancient Iraq or they found them in Iraq, but they go back to, you know, Sumeria and all that. And the story is it if you ever get a chance to read it, it's the Epic of Gilgamesh. It is so cleverly written. You know, it's one of our oldest literature, you know, pieces. It pre- predates the story of in the Bible about Noah. There's a guy in the book that the same stories in there. And so there's like mm. lots, lots of similarities. But the gist of the Epic of Gilgamesh is it's more important to be a grandfather than to seek fame and fortune. <laughs> I mean, mm. you're, you know, he's seeking immortality and he fights, he fights the big, you know, monster on the hill humbaba and he goes on an you know adventure under the earth and meets the scorpio man and but in the end like that's really the takeaway Mm. like be be a father be a grandfather enjoy your Mm. meal like so it's not much different right yeah well that and space right of like yeah go on these big journeys travel to these (laughs) other worlds like do your dreaming do your you know all of this and then just come back and have a good meal with the people around you that you care about you know (laughs) and I think that some of what for me is like that 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 bridge between sort of the technology and this right like Mm -hmm. like spin off into this space where yeah there's these, I had a conversation recently with a woman, she was talking about no place, you know, an anthropological idea of no place, right? Like, uh-huh. like there's like, we're either we're of a place, which like ties us to kind of our bodies and the land and the, you know, the cultural and social web around us. Right. And then there's like these places of no place. Right. And so it's like, yeah, we can spend a lot of time in these places of no place, but then like, but, but why are we here in these bodies? Why are we <laughs> incarnate as organisms? If not to also like eat a meal and hang out with uh-huh. people and like, and be here now, meaning like in this 3d reality too. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, all of the adventures that we do to excite ourselves, what, no matter what level or direction, or, you know, there's nothing more important though, than, you know, it's being together. Mm you know, like coming together. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cause I mean, I feel like even adventures, you know, they can be another form of like escaping, Uh which then takes, you know, we think we need adventure or excitement to like be joyful. And in reality, like sometimes those are the things that actually, like, those are the things we embark on when we're trying to find our way back to joy in some way it feels like, or or trying to, you know, that pain or whatever, the fear becoming the ballast for creativity, like you said, you know. That, yeah, um, like making making us feel alive, I think. Yeah. People, because I love adventure stories, you know, or, mm-hmm. and I, I obviously I'm out in the wilderness, like doing all kinds of fun stuff. Um, But it's just like, I don't know, just like some can make you feel alive. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. And there's people that will go around the world and and maybe like come back and realize that nothing, you know, that it was where that, that 10,000 mile journey begins under your feet or whatever, mm-hmm, 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 you know, that kind mm-hmm, of thing. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't have to go so far. Yeah. Because everywhere you went, there you were anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But you couldn't have known if you didn't go. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that feels like a beautiful place to kind of start to land, land the plane for today and start to kind of. <laughs> what if you? Whoa, I know, goodness. right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So, is there anything you know? I want to give you an opportunity to kind of share more about. Yeah. Like, uh, I'll have all of the links in in the show notes and everything, but kind of a little bit more about where people can find you or kind of what you sort of have alluded to your website already and some of what's on there, but if you want to kind of flesh that out at all, out at all, or, and also offer you an opportunity, if there's any like final thoughts or kind of final um, pieces that feel like they want to be spoken um, to kind of, yeah, to close out this conversation for today. Well, um, on my website, Cafe a Soul, which I think you already spelled it, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, there you can look at 
different, you know, there's different oracles to kind of have a conversation with yourself, kind of the way I look at it, the dream dictionary, you can type your dream in and it will interpret it. And, um, and, you know, you can contact me if you want to do dream work or, you know, live joyfully or all the different coaching that I do. And um, I just, you know, think that it's kind of, obviously life is, life is bigger and more profound than, than we'll ever really be able to articulate. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. my feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that wonder is important. So don't let anybody tell you that you're, it's not real. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Whatever you think is real is real. Mm. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Hmm. So on that note, we'll just uh, <laughs> turn our gaze back to our virtual fire, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> our otherworldly fire. And uh, yeah, just take a moment, take a few breaths in and out. And just, um, yeah, invite whatever, maybe one or two takeaways you have from this conversation today, whatever things kind of landed or shook something for you or um, felt like a deep yes or an invitation or whatever it might be. Just um, let those kind of trickle gently down into your body through the layers of your existence. Perhaps letting yourself feel some wonder. <laughs> Maybe there's one thing in your environment right now or one thing in this conversation you just heard that opened you to some wonder. And so if so, yeah, just um, let that feeling be there. And if that feels like a different or challenging feeling, you can always imagine sort of your body as a river bank and you just ask that the banks be widened to hold a little bit more of that flow of wonder through your system, through your body, through your brain, through your heart, through your mouth and throat, the place where we tell our stories, where we help determine how we're seeing things. And so with that, we close our fire for today and go our separate ways until next time. And so thank you so much for being here, Carrie. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure getting to know you today. Yeah, yeah. This was a lovely conversation. I really appreciate you and your time. <laughs> okay. So wonderful. Take care, everyone. Hi, Kate here again. Thank you for gathering with us. Whether you've been here a while or found your way here thanks to today's guest, it means so much to me and the world I dream of to have you here. I hope you'll tune in for more of our conversations. We humans seem to be at a profound threshold and facing questions of deep impact for the future and the world. We need our full hearts and humanity as we sow seeds of change in these times of joy and heartbreak. I count myself lucky to be here now, around this virtual village fire, weaving our stories into a medicine with humans like you. As a community medicine space, this podcast is relational. It weaves webs of connection and mutual respect and care across time and space. If you appreciate and support the future we're seeding here, you can support the weaving of this web in a few ways. One, share episodes with friends and family or online with your community. It also helps the podcast immensely if you like, rate, subscribe to, or follow the podcast where you watch or listen, so you get notified when new episodes drop and new listeners find us as they search. Two, join us on Patreon. Doing so supports conversations like the one you just heard and allows you access to live community gatherings and medicine circles and more as we continue to grow. It also helps me keep the space advertisement free so the conversations stay intact as they are. If you have questions, suggestions, connections, or would like to find out more about working with me, you can find me online at www.wildsacredjourney.com, on Instagram at wildsacredjourney underscore KP, or email me, kate at wildsacredjourney.com. Until next time, from my heart to yours, 
I release today's fire with a prayer for our individual and collective wholeness, connection, and joy. May it be so.